Good morning. Nice to meet you. Ricky, you got to tell me the, the inspiration behind all of this, because this is on so many people's minds, but a lot of people would rather hide from it than talk about it. Yeah, actually, the, the inspiration for this book, um, it's it's in part a follow up to my co-author's book, The Coddling of the American Mind. Mm -hmm. But I was not involved in the first process or first project. He reached out to me to co-author his second book um, because in part we span generations. I'm 23. He's 49. I'm of the right. and He's of the left politically. Um, but we agree that cancel culture is a fundamental threat to um, to our project of human knowledge and to our our democracy, because if we can't speak and, and have have meaningful, thoughtful conversations and, and robust disagreement without attacking other people, then then we're going to go nowhere as a society and um, and delve towards censorship, which is not a, a, a future that I want to live in. Well, you've obviously been inside my journals because I've talked about this so much in my daily writing because I'm trying to document as much as I can about where we are in history so that maybe one day somebody in the future will say, oh, what they taught me at school has nothing to do with what he just put on that page all those years ago. Yeah, I think that one thing that's really important um, is that we as a society and our school system especially have really drifted away from the kind of classic debate club sort of formats of being able to have conversations and, and disagreements without actually ascribing your beliefs to the person. So I think that our school system has really moved away from teaching young people to be resilient, to agree civilly or disagree civilly with one another, um, and to really inculcate the the fundamental values that underpin a democracy and the, the old idioms that that so many people, so many older Americans grew up with that I unfortunately didn't like to each their own and everyone's entitled to their own opinion and it's a free country. We instead have replaced sticks and stones with the idea that words can wound and that that words can literally be violence and that you need safe spaces and trigger warnings. And so our education system has really failed to create and foster a generation of young people who are able to delve into disagreement civilly. You know, I'm blessed with the opportunity to talk with a lot of comedians as well as authors even YA authors for the young adults, they are in mm -hmm. fear of being canceled somewhere along the way that somewhere along, you know, in their storytelling, oh my God, I didn't mean to mean it that way. You interpreted it that way. Yeah. And they're, they're afraid of being taken off the shelves. Yeah, I think uh, um, one thing that, that really has been a scary shift is that we've moved away from the idea that it's not it's not the, the way that you feel that matters, it's the intention behind the words. And if somebody is misunderstood or if they made a mistake, we've been so graceless to ascribe the worst possible intention to them. Um, and you might be interested in, in our book we have um, throughout the, the book, it's, it's spliced up with case studies, and one of them is about comedy, which I think is a really scary place to mm -hmm. have cancel culture bear its head because you know th these are the kind of cathartic moments where we're all supposed to be able to laugh together through the most sensitive and, and difficult issues comedy has a very important role to play in society but another one is publishing which you know it's really scary to see the the very illiberal squeaky wheels that sometimes work in publishing houses who try to get publishing contracts canceled before the book is even yep. written if yep. they don't like the person's viewpoint or the young adult uh, uh, genre to your point is probably one of the most vicious in terms of cancel culture we actually have a story in there of a young man who um who is a, a young adult author who was often at the helm of canceling other people and then got a cancel mob himself and actually had his own contract canceled because he he asked for it to be canceled because he he felt so guilty when it turns back on him but that's the important thing to remember is nobody is perfect everyone makes a mistake everyone has an unflattering moment and unless we all stop cancel culture it could come for any of us at any point in time yeah, one of the things that's kind of scary in the everyday world is, and, and somebody who has conversations with people and asks a lot of questions, is that people are trained to come up with answers to the questions. They'll, they'll want uh, questions way before we even have the conversation, or they, they, they have coaches that say, okay, if this is what's asked, this is how you have to say it so that you're not canceled. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, I mean, I, I totally understand why people feel that way. It's it's scary, especially when you're in the public eye and you have a microphone in front of you mm -hmm. more often than the typical person. I mean, it's it's easy to trip up. Everyone makes a mistake. Everyone will make a mistake. And we're, we've been so ruthless and graceless. But I think that unless we actually want to um, live in a society where everyone's self-censoring, everyone's sitting on their hands. I mean, one statistic that really brought it to life for me was um, a survey 
a survey of college students right now that found that roughly two thirds of them are self-censoring on campus. And that's the exact sort of place where you'd want a young person to feel comfortable in a classroom conversation, to put their viewpoint out there, to maybe disagree with somebody, to be able to have a civil dialogue because like our, our institutions of learning and just our society more broadly can only thrive if we're able to actually talk through our differences. And instead you have people who are, are entering conversations, whether it's an interview or whether it's a, a, a seminar at a college, a college campus who are calculated in their words, who mm-hmm. are afraid that everything will come back to bite them and who are not being authentic to themselves. I do think it's a, a very serious crisis of authenticity. How does the average person heal from this? An institution, because we see what's going on with Bud Light. Michigan is now in trouble because of something that happened over the weekend. There's a lot of things that can put you in a position of, oh my God, I think it's over. But we've got to rebuild and replenish. Yeah, I think, well, one thing that I um, I disagree with some critics of cancel culture and that I don't believe that you should never apologize. I think that if something is genuinely a mistake and it's something that you would apologize to a friend to and it becomes public, you should say that, you know, this is not reflective of me and I regret doing it. However, I think for a lot of people who get canceled, it's getting canceled over who they voted for. Absolutely do not apologize to the mob. I think that's one way that you give more fuel to the fire. You make them feel as though you're not um, you're not really staunch in your beliefs or that, that you're feeble and that you're weak. And oftentimes the people, especially on social media, who are demanding that people um, be torn down or fired from their jobs are not actually looking for an apology. They're not, they're not looking to, to just tie a nice little bow on it and move on to their next victim. They will tear people down ruthlessly. Yeah. So I think when people are caught up in a cancel mob, if it is genuinely something that, that you don't regret and that is a part of who you are, absolutely do not apologize for that. I know that we have the book, The Canceling of the American Mind, but there's got to be a website or, or a YouTube video, something that's going to take us beyond this book. What do you got? My co-author... Um, he, he runs an organization called FIRE, which is the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. And we put out a video series on their YouTube channel. Um, there is also a ton of other very uh, interesting and engaging resources on their website for anyone who believes in free speech and who's interested in continuing this fight. Um, and I would also say, check out my podcast. Um, check out my New York Post column um, because free speech is, is near and dear to my heart and something that I often talk about. Excellent. Will you be brilliant today? And please come back to this show anytime in the future, okay? Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it.